this is episode 12 or 13 but this it's is really episode 13 <laughs> like episode two of the quarantine i'm perspective radio but uh thank you very much i'm your host co-host jovel h whitfield and i am nessie alam and we are very grateful that you guys are able to join us here tonight i know it was a little bit a last minute request i think um everything is moving very quickly and so even in this we've been moving a little bit urgently so thank you for joining us um tonight's episode is actually the on health essential workers perspective conversation um there's a lot that's happening out there and um i do think that a lot of you know the healthcare workers they're definitely getting a lot of recognition but there's also a lot of essential workers that are out there that we may we may be aware of but we might not be aware of as well either and so we just want to have that conversation um because there's a lot of people out in the workforce that are video i don't know if you guys actually we're going to start off with the first question after we do the introductions um, and we'll get a little bit into that of what an essential worker even is. So if you guys just don't mind taking time to introduce yourselves, um, um, you know, you really are just speaking for yourself today during this conversation. We can expect for you to be representing um, any of your jobs or anything like that. You're speaking on your own perspective. So for those of you who have been to a previous event, um, you know, we always speak on your own personal experience we don't represent anyone else. You might have um, points that you might be able to refer to from your job, but you know, however you want to identify for this call, please let us know. And um, Eric, I'll let you start first since you are waiting here patiently. All right, hey guys, um, I am Eric I'm from the Bronx. I am a restaurant worker. I've been working in the restaurant industry for 11 years now. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ashley. Hey everyone, my name is Ashley. Um, I am a flight attendant and I've been in this industry. Um, this is my six month anniversary this month. So. Okay, good evening. My name is Sean. Um, I work for New York City Transit. I've been employed with New York City Transit for the last 15 years. Great. All right, great. Thank you. and Welcome, everybody. So let's jump right in it because you know, that's what we're here for. So when we started talking about essential workers, um, I don't even know if we've ever talked about essential workers prior to maybe a month ago. You know, I know the term has been out there, but like it's been a real big thing now, now that we're determining who is essential and everything. And that's not the premise of these conversations, but we want to really kind of get the feel from you all of, did, do you see yourself as essential uh, now? Or did you always see the profession that you jumped in as essential? Do you have a different feel for what essential is now? And anybody can jump in there. <laughs> All right. I mean, I as restaurant workers, we definitely essential. There's a lot of people that don't cook, or there's a lot of hospital workers that work 18-hour days and they need to eat. They have no other choice. Um, I did not see ourselves as essential before this. I did not think that was a thing. I didn't even know that was a thing in general. But uh, I mean, here we are, and it's necessary for us to work and be able to deliver food and maintain the safety standards that restaurants do maintain while we're doing so. All right, does that change, or did that change your view of even the restaurant industry? Was it like a job before, and now you see it in a different way? Um, I, I always, you know, took pride working in restaurants. You know, there's definitely people that are like, oh, you know, you're just handing out food, but it's definitely not the case. You know, there's, there's we follow such strict uh, health and safety standards that when this started, we didn't really change much. This is what we were right. doing normally. Right, right. Okay, All right. great, excellent. Sean? Um, with, with, with me, um, as far as in working for the MCAA, 
of course, we the um one of the vital um ways to tra to travel with, um throughout New York City. So I kind of knew we was essential. I didn't know we was essential up until the extent of what we're dealing with now. You know, as far as you know, natural disasters, stuff that you know is uncommon of uh, happening, like the coronavirus um pandemic right now we're dealing with. You know, we dealt with this 9-11, um, Sandy, and other things that's happened throughout the city. But we never dealt with something like this, um, and we never dealt with the loss that we are um, dealing with currently right now. Right. right. And we'll definitely have a chance to get more individually into your individual, um, you know, experiences. Um, so we definitely want to talk a little bit more about that, because I don't think um, everyone is really aware of, you know, I, some of us read the news a little bit too much, maybe like myself, but I think other people maybe are not so much aware of like what's really happening and the impact that's really taking place out there, like on so many different levels and so many different fields as well. Yeah, Gosh. with, with essential work is becoming yeah. a, a hot topic per se. I think a lot of people are focusing as they should be on our medical uh, family that's out there. But uh, as Sean just kind of mentioned, it's like people are losing friends and coworkers and all of these other uh, fields of workers, uh, essential workers. So we'll, we'll surely get in that. Ashley, how do you feel? Um, so for me, when I went to training for this job and before training, when I did my research, um, I knew that the airline industry, it was considered frontline workers. Um, but frontline. So for us, what that means is, or for me, speaking on um, just um, on my behalf, what that means is that being a frontline worker means that in the air, thirty-six thousand feet, there there aren't a plethora of um, firefighters or officers or nurses, doctors, or whoever who can. Okay, so I think she might have cut off a little bit over there. That's right. Okay. Um, so I think Ashley, when she gets back to us, will continue with her story. So, uh, you know, you both, Eric and Sean, you mentioned that you didn't really realize the extent of Ashley. Okay. So, one. Ashley, so you are breaking up a little bit and we are not able to hear the last part of what you just said. Hmm, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> well, we gotta get Ashley back in a moment. Yes. Okay, so while we wait on Ashley, um, Prof, you're here with us here tonight too. So I know you're part of the whole essential workers Group. So if you don't just mind introducing yourself a little bit and what your definition of essential worker is and if it's changed since this whole pandemic has started. Well, for me, it definitely hasn't changed much as far as being an essential worker due to the fact that the position that I hold is classified as emergency response. So we respond to train incidents, trains breaking down, mm -hmm and people committing suicide and things like that. So being essential, I kind of get it. And when the system shuts down, we're the ones that are out there the most. So for me, it's been the same. Not too happy about having to be in the position, but I did kind of sign up for it at this point. So it is what it is. Yeah. yeah. So that's a great point that you make that you're not necessarily happy about being in the position that you're in um what you know really all of you can answer this what is the sense of responsibility or duty that you have around um being an essential worker or in that field okay she's back. um all right ashley so we're gonna actually come back to you and um do you want uh, your one-on-one -on -one. um the question right now that i just presented out is um what's your how, what do you feel your obligation is to your role as you in the role that you're in and do you think that um 
Yeah, let's we'll start with that first and then we'll go to the next thing. Oh, am I first or? Whoever wants to jump in, you can see okay, the line. I'll jump in since I said something. I'm sorry about that. My service here is kind of choppy. We're um, all working on this together. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome sauce. Um, Can't even be mad. You're not in the studio? What, man? We all in the studio, actually. <laughs> we are in the studio. Channeling in that studio vibes, you know. Um, I would say my role... Um, do, all right, I have a question for you. So when you ask what our role is, do you mean the role that, you know, people think we play or the role that we're actually playing? Because I think that's... Um, if uh -huh. you have a differentiation, then, you know, definitely let us know. Um, okay. I wasn't even getting that deep. So, you, oh. yeah, so definitely let us know what the, you know, what the difference is. Maybe, we, you know, people have a certain stereotype assumption of what a flight attendant is doing and what you're actually required to do. So. Okay. Um, so I would think I would start with the role that people think we're playing. I think that people just think that we're flying to and from. Um, I think that most people only, they don't, they don't, I, I find that people don't look at us as essential or frontline. You know, people don't notice or don't know the role that we play. I believe and I feel from the questions I'm asked or the things that said that what we're doing is literally just flying to and from, you know, um, and that's it. Or we're serving them Coke and peanuts and um, that's about it. What I was what I want to share that we actually are doing. We're like one of my trips when the borders were shutting down, um, it was us or it was one of my flights. I flew someone who was trying to get back home. You know, I'm flying people who have 24 hours or less or seven days or less and they're trying to get back home. I'm flying in families to loved ones who are dying. I'm flying doctors and nurses to hospitals so that they can get the support that they need in other states and other countries. We're flying medical equipment. We're flying so many things that it's not recognized by the public because to them, we're just a great vacation destination. But they forget that when things go down, we're before coronavirus was even talked about and before coronavirus was a thing to anyone when it was happening in other countries we were still flying we were still engaged in coming in contact with these people who were sick you know um and just like doctors <laughs> we don't get that we don't get to say that we're not going to work right and i'll leave it there Thank you. That's a great point, man. Thank you. Thank you for that. That mile high perspective, because um, who would know that unless you're in that position? I, that that's definitely something to consider when we talk again about essential, getting people around, flying people around, on the is be it in the air or an MTA bus, train, and everything like that. So that's a great perspective. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah. Thank you for that. Anyone else can jump in, you know, oh, feel free. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's why she said, like, you know, she always has to go to work. It's the same thing with restaurant workers. Restaurant workers, I mean, by law, we have sick days. But essentially, if you go to a restaurant and you call in sick, you're fine. That is mm. how the industry works. So, you know, people who are sick, uh, especially at the beginning of this virus, were still going to work because their jobs mm -hmm. weren't letting them call out. We started getting emails maybe in middle of March saying, okay, if people call out, I'll let them. Otherwise, normally the standard in a restaurant is if your worker called out, find a way to fire them the next day. And that is the rule in the restaurant industry. And that's pretty much any restaurant. Obviously that's illegal, but just just cause it's illegal doesn't mean it doesn't go down. Mm. Okay. So not only are you guys essential, but you guys don't have the option of no option of even just taking care of yourself. You're, it's a choice of getting to work or 
you know, losing your job essentially, right? So exactly what it is. Right. I would like to jump in on what Eric said really quickly. Um, it wasn't until about two weeks ago that the airlines were allowed to wear masks, like air flight attendants. And I believe that that's absolutely disgusting. You know, um, we've been fighting since the beginning. If we have to come to work, allow us to protect ourselves. Um, in the airline industry also, when you, like Eric said, yeah, we're granted sick days. Oh my gosh, it sounds so great, right? But as a flight attendant, every time you, first off, our sick days work in such a way, it's a point system. And so once you re reach a certain amount of points, you're basically up for termination. Um, and the, the points aren't high, right? Um, and that's the space where it's like, what can be done? I know flight attendants who were flying knowing they were showing symptoms, right? Because maybe they called out previously for another yeah. emergency. And we're, you know? we're definitely gonna get a little bit more yeah. into that of the, like, you know, what that looks like when we are res responsible in, in our workplace. Right. Sean, you wanted to jump in a little bit? Well, like I said, I know I work for the NTA, so basically we have we have the same thing that um, Ashley and Eric were saying. Um, as far as protection goes, we since day one, we have we haven't been talking with our union reps about getting masks and gloves and protecting yeah. suits to wear throughout the stations. Now, just like Ashley said, you know, she's she works with the airline industry and transit, as you know, since this pandemic's been going on, people still riding the trains at an alarming rates. They're not staying home, they're not taking this seriously. And just like Ashley said also, there's people that's showing symptoms for my job that still got to come to work because maybe they don't have the sick days mm -hmm. or they get threatened to come home, threatened to come to work or lose their job, which means for everybody else, the public and their coworkers in jeopardy of getting sick and possibly dying. And we still, as we speak right now, still going through this, no supplies. No gloves, no masks. You mm -hmm. essentially got to buy your own. If you luck, you can find them right now. Yeah, yeah one of my uh, friends who's also a bus driver, he just mentioned he just got a mask today for the first time. So I did not know that. You know, that's, you know, there's a lot of initiatives out there right now that are making masks as there's a shortage of supplies for the healthcare workers. Um, they recently just, you know, mentioned that everyone should be wearing masks not just you know essentials and any, like anyone just going outside should be wearing masks it could be airborne right um and that do you feel like has there been actually really the question that i'm asking has there been any sort of support shown for people in your industry have outside groups showing any kind of support to you guys at all around that forget your you know present jobs but has there been um an outpour of like gratitude or niceness or anything like that towards you guys now that you didn't experience before i mean people are supportive and and um for the mta workers i mean i'm not asking for recognition you know i just ask for respect we out here with hundreds and hundreds of people that still ride in subways not covered up or in schemes and whatever the case may be and being that you can't get tested unless you're about to drop dead, no pun intended, excuse me. Being yeah. that you can't get tested unless you're showing symptoms, you don't know who has it. I can't even be around my mom, who's a cancer survivor and have asthma due to the fact that I work for transit and I can't get tested because I'm not showing any symptoms. So I can't just bring that around my mom not knowing that I could possibly be effective and even worse. This is the things mm -hmm. I go with every day. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like he said, I mean, like with my mom, I sent her to her apartment and she's been there. And I haven't seen her like four weeks and that's it. Um, but people, I think, treat restaurant workers still the same as they always have. And they think of them at low end of the totem pole. Um, you know, I, I've worked in every, I guess, facet of the industry. 
And if I'm wearing a button up or something as a manager, you get a little more respect. But if you're just dressed as a server and walking around, they just don't really think of you as a human or something. It's the best way to describe it. So there hasn't really been any more gratitude. Um, when we were still seeing a lot of customers coming in for takeout, they were still rushing you. You know, at the end of the day, every customer, after I handed something to them, I would have to go and wash my hands because that's the only way to keep this from staying steady. But they were still like, I don't understand why I don't have my coffee after 30 plus seconds. Obviously, there is a whole thing going around, but they don't look to be in your shoes for that. So can you, Eric, can you tell us, I mean, those are, I mean, you know, those are some great examples of like, first of all, why the reasoning behind why the service would be slower, but not that I think it makes it any better for them to treat you in any, you know, in that kind of fashion in the first place. Um, but what are some things that you would want the public to know, the people who are coming to you and picking up takeout, who are still coming and looking for food, you know, instead of making something at home and expecting the same kind of service they did, let's say pre-quarantine, right? So what would you want them to know? Like besides you guys are definitely washing your hands, so hygiene's a thing, right? So Yeah, um we definitely um the hygiene is always up there. Um I've never I've only worked in one restaurant company that it wasn't very uh clean, but everything else has always been, you know, very good with that. Now the people have to understand that one, um restaurants run on like a five percent profit. That's it. So when something like this hits, all restaurants right now, I would assume, are running at a loss currently. So they have maybe a manager that takes the money and there are two delivery guys and one person in the kitchen. So they're not, your items are not coming fast. They're ordering much less items. So you're going to be out of a lot of food and a lot of ingredients because they can't have, you know, cases and cases of the stuff coming in every day because it'll go bad. Um, I think people need to understand that they're working with the best that they have and they're trying to do their best job. Obviously, they don't want to upset anybody, but customers and guests have to be patient. And something that took 10 minutes may take 45 minutes now. And that's just how it has to be because restaurant workers are also worried about their safety, just like everybody else in society is. Yeah, thank you. Prof? Do you want yes. to ask? Yeah. Well, I would say this with what is going on and the question that you posed earlier. Although we are essential personnel, we tend to want to help and do more for the people that are around us. And what we have to realize is that we have to take precautions to keep ourselves safe. And in this day and time, a lot of transit workers are actually passing away. It's not being televised and things of that nature, but as of today, I think we have 28, 29 confirmed transit employees that did pass away and 3,500 employees that are quarantined right now. So that's about 10% of the actual complete transit staff. Mm -hmm. We're out there every day touching some of the dirtiest, filthiest things. Mm -hmm. And we're not taking the precautions as we should because a lot of the supplies are not there. Now, with that said, Prof, because we often, you know, you guys are talking to me like, hey, we're not talking on behalf of the industry mm -hmm. and everything. So I will take this moment with what you just said, because that's real stuff. Uh, just to, like, how are you guys doing? How are you dealing with this, you know, with maybe losing some of uh, your coworkers or prof. I know you're saying this is kind of a thing that you're used to, but I'm sure it's different, you know. Um, what what you just mentioned uh, about, sorry, what Eric just mentioned about not seeing his mom, he kind of like just brushed over that. Like, yeah, I haven't seen my mom in three weeks, but like, how have you been coping and dealing with this? It's crazy because for me, my kids live in Queens. So I can't mm -hmm. even see my kids because one, I, I understand that the job that I have, I'm exposed to this element a lot. And then mm -hmm. to top it all off, dealing with coworkers that are dying. I have people that are in the same title as me that are being diagnosed with testing positive for the coronavirus. Then we're having the same people in the same title passing away. So 
we're we're all doing the same thing. And just like medical workers, nurses and doctors on the forefront, they're there, they're putting themselves last to take care of their patients, like everyone else that on this call showing up to work does. Mm. Yeah. So there was something that I, I seen earlier, they call us essential because they can't call us sacrificial because mm. that would be telling more the truth. So we're out there being sacrificed by, you know, that title of essential. Mm. Yeah. And, um, gosh, I'm sorry. I'm in the cut. Pete, no, um, Pete, um, as you know, I work for Transit also as well. I believe the total now is um, over 30 for people that passed away. At least 31, 32, 33. They, uh, there are other, there's other people that passed, but they don't know if it's actually for the from the um, coronavirus at the moment. Because we just lost two more within the last couple of hours, three hours ago. Oh, well, yeah, I, I didn't get that update. So, yeah, that definitely would have put us over 30. Yeah, a station agent and a couple of other um, RCC um, people that passed away. Yeah. It, it, I heard, yeah. Oh, uh, go ahead, Lucy. I don't, I don't wanna no, no, finish, finish what you were saying. How does that, how has that been um, impacting you? Impacting, I lost, um, this one one of the girls that passed away, I don't know if y'all know her story, but she was trying to call for help for days before she passed away. The hotline that they gave us in MTA, as Pete could tell you, it's about over 40,000 of us. So imagine if you're feeling sick and you're trying to call and it's only one number mm. for 40,000 people to call. Wow. So that means it's busy. Yeah. By the time you reach your, by your symptoms reach to the point where you gotta get get medical work done, you could be dead. Just like my coworker died in her apartment. Right. And her family had to be tasked with the with, tasked with the un, unforgiving task of looking at her body, taking pictures for the cops because the cops came in. And they didn't even have masks and gloves. They made her daughter and son take pictures of her dead, sending it to them on the phone. Mm -hmm. That's how much respect, I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, what um, Prof mentioned earlier about the sacrificial, you know, you know, we say essential, but sacrificial might be, um, it, that might be what it's like right now, based on statistics. Um, yep. Yep. the rate of death is just, it's ridiculous. And if you, it's probably because a lot of them are also part of this essential worker working group class. Um, you know, it's definitely something we can talk about, you know, during this call. Um, Eric, how are you doing? Um, I am good so far. You know, it's, I understand why we're seeing, I guess, a sacrificial, um, but uh, you know, for society to run, we, everyone who's here in this chat right now, we need to be able to still go to work, but they need to do things to protect the workers at the same time. And they're not, they can't even protect the doctors and the nurses. So we're not even on their radar right now. You know, um, I do wish it was more preparation, but, but I don't really see that happening for another you know, month or two. Okay. Oh, we had paused. Okay. Got it. I think you had uh, the way for setting. Well, Ashley? Um, yeah. The first question that was asked um, by you was Do we get more praise or how, um, are we, do we feel like we've been noticed more? um since this happened and um i would say absolutely not um i i feel like uh an invisible employee although the government states that we're essential and we have this special letter that we carry around for why we need to be out 
in public if there's ever a lockdown anywhere in the world um we're protected in that sense mm -hmm. um so but by the public and everyone else yeah i feel very invisible um and so when it goes back to how do i feel i feel well i, I feel like my feelings have been shifting from the beginning to now at first i was angry um then i was disappointed um flight attendants you know i wish i could tell you how many people were sick in the industry we had to on our own start a group a facebook page where all the airlines came together to try to record our own data and every single day there's postings from <laughs> airlines a to z stating who's been affected and it's really sad um we don't get we have started to get a few headlines in the media and it's because people were outraged by the fact that no one gives a damn you know so yeah that's how i feel but that's interesting that you guys home. yeah yeah it's we're not allowed to go home so i mean Sorry. some people can and like I have friends who are sleeping in their the garage or you know quarantine to a room when they do go home if they're allowed to people who can't go home period and yeah so right um it's interesting as you guys mentioned the count of the people that have been affected in your specific industries and I was thinking about Eric and I'm like I don't think I don't even know how you would start to measure restaurant workers that are affected by it because a lot of them, you know, may not even be like, let's say citizens, right? Um, a lot of them are not necessarily um, people that would report, like would be able to seek healthcare even if they were affected or not, you know? So um, it's just a, uh, that's just something that was just popping up for me or you know as you we were talking about that like having insurance and not having insurance right like as a mta worker you guys have statistics and numbers that maybe you know ashley just mentioned they had to create a whole facebook group for even though they have a, i thought they would have a larger corporation doing that to be honest i, I didn't realize that you guys had to go and do that on your own um so the, um, why have you, why do you guys still do your job? Like, why are you doing your job? Why did you get into it? And why are you still doing your job? I'll start off. I don't even, hear, I don't even have an answer for that. Um, you, you know, you take a test yeah. and a position is open. The, like the, the position I have now is a station clerk. So, you know, when I first came into NTA, I took, the, I was a traffic checker, then I took a test to be a track worker. That position was full, filled up, so they gave me the station cleaning the arm thing, um, position. You know, I was, a, I was, I'm a former Marine, so, you know, I definitely would love that I've been finishing my career in the, mil in the military, vice being here right around this right now. But you know, I'm not a picky person. I take what I can get, you know, as far as making ends meet and do what I need to do for myself and my family. So other than that, you know, I'm just, you know, sort of striving to do what I need to do to take care of myself, to be a, be a better person, and more importantly, just pay my bills. Well, we thank you for your service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah personally, for me, um, definitely fell in love with my particular job. Um, only because emergency response, everything is, every day is different. So for me, I enjoyed the, the thrill of having to respond to certain things and being able to assist people and get trains moving. And if a train was stuck in a tunnel, be able to evacuate and do the things that I do, or if someone was struck by a train, be able to be there and assist. Um, 
which my job has always been crazy. It's just now it's it's a little more to worry about because there's extra precaution you have to take just walking into a train car or walking down to the track. So just walking into a train station and transit will never shut down. So because we, as they say, if you've been on a bus or a train lately, transit is working now to move essential employees from point A to point B. They did it during Sandy. Every natural disaster we had here, they still move. That it never shut down, except for when they sh- had that strike situation. But that will never happen again. <laughs> like Sandy, hurricanes, whatever. But the money getting in the way, then maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So, okay. Uh, Eric, what, what about you? Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought completely. Um, Happens all can time. you repeat the question one more time? Well, Why do you do your work, the job that you're doing? Um, yeah, I mean, especially post all of this going on. I mean, I, I got hired at 18. I didn't know any better. I didn't know what was happening. Um, but, you know, I stayed in industry because I like it. I am not made for an office. I don't want to sit at home all day typing on the computer. Mm-hmm. I can't do that. Um, and he said it was a, uh, you know, it's something new every day, and it is. You have no idea what you're going to get. I've, you know, I've come in, and I've had regular days where I'm just handing food out. Mm-hmm. And I've come in, and I've seen people die from food. And I've seen both sides of things, and you don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And, um, um, sadly, as of right now, um, we are no longer working in my job because the deliveries weren't cutting it. And that's what's going to happen at most restaurants if they shut down. George, I know. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the liquor store down the block, they shut down. Sorry. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. okay. Say that again, everybody. Yeah, um, there's, there's, um, um, as of right now, in the last couple of weeks, uh, my restaurant closed, um, because they just simply don't make enough money from deliveries to justify staying open, and that's what's going to happen with most restaurants. Um, I have no problem going to work because I do view it as an essential thing, and uh, I think we take every precaution as possible. But um, I would say within the next month. Besides huge chains like McDonald's, uh, most restaurants will be shut down even for the week because they can't afford to stay open. You say you're mostly good, but you you haven't seen your mother in a while, right? Me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's been uh, since the first week of March. So, you know, we we get stuck there. You know, I live alone. Uh, We get stuck there. And... um, and uh, I was like, hey, you know, because I, I enjoy reading. I was like, make sure you get everything and stay home and you don't come out. But she has underlying conditions. She's uh, almost 60. Um, I can't have her outside when this is happening, knowing that she is the high risk that is talked about. Mm. That's, man. That's major. When we talk about as far as um, how that impacts, man, that's, that's, that's crazy. Um, <clears throat> Ash, Ashton. Um, I chose this job um, at first because I love to travel. Um, I did my research and knew what was required, um, and I worked really hard to get it. Um, I went to a very extensive training and I worked really hard to get this job and to start this career. So, yeah, the idea of throwing it all away after all the sacrifices I've made, um, to me, it's it's very slim to none. Mm -hmm. Um, Not going to happen. Yeah. Not going to happen. <laughs> Pause for a second. No, no. So, so I know that um, you know, there's a way of you know us seeing essential workers in specific positions in a certain way pre quarantine. Um, we're definitely I think a lot of people are, you know, a lot of people are grateful. There might be some people who are not aware or not you know 
mindful or cognizant, but I do think there's a lot of gratitude towards our essential workers um, during this time. Um, you know, and there's still some time, we're not even out of this yet, but what do you guys envision for your profession, what that looks like once we come out of this? Um, and, you know, what you guys hope to see for yourselves in your positions, are you hoping to, whether it's through your own job, whether it's through society, but like, what kind of, you know, maybe you're demanding respect, I don't know, you know, what that looks like, but what do you see for your position in the future? Um, Eric, I know that, you know, we just got the $15 minimum salary award, right? And so, like, a lot of people are now like, oh, yeah, you know, there's memes out there that are like, yeah, they deserve it. That's why, like, oh, yeah, you know, and you guys are trying to take it away from them, right? Do you think that you guys deserve a pay raise after this? Um, we deserve health benefits. Like, what does that look like for you guys? What do you think you're more deserving of? I mean, uh, the way I see it is um, as in the management position, uh, they force managers in the restaurant industry to work 60, 70 hours a week. I think maybe that should drop so they can have a bit of more of a home life. Mm -hmm. um, servers, um, you go out to eat, just tip your server. Like, as far as minimum wage for a server, they don't really care about it. It's not, it doesn't affect them. All their money comes from, from the guests that's sitting down in the restaurant. Um, I definitely think, you know, uh, sick days should be viewed as a thing that you can take. And uh, most restaurants, there's a couple in the city that do it, should have a dedicated staff that come in when somebody else calls out. So it's not viewed as, oh, you left me hanging by calling out today and now I have to get rid of you. Um, and obviously, I, with any industry, you know, people should get paid more. Working in a restaurant is not easy. It's hard. Probably one of the hardest jobs in the world. Um, compared to most studies um, that they do on them. So, um, yeah, obviously, more money is great. Well, for me, I think that essential workers should be definitely viewed a lot differently, and the government should take actual precautions to have the supplies that are needed. Maybe there should be legislation put in there to make sure that there are extra supplies because who knows if this was happening. We are expected to be where we are in our job titles, wherever we are working, we should be supplied with the things that we are needed as they're calling it PPE, personal protective equipment. So these are the things that we should have without question, not waiting weeks and months while people are dropping dead and getting sick, stuff should be available. The union should be stepping up for us. This should be a wake-up call for a lot of industries. Yeah, that's what we've been hearing a lot in conversations just as far as imagine, man, imagine a a wake-up amongst all of the industries you know, uh, as every industry is exposed more of how they've been prepared for their workers, how they've been treating them, what they have in times of crisis or shit on Saturday. <laughs> Um, so, thank you, thank you, Frog. Just a little bit of background noise, so maybe we can put ourselves on mute. Yeah. It's better. All right, uh, Ash, Ash, Ashley, Ashley along. <laughs> um, that's a loaded question for me. Um. What I hope to come out of it is I wish that airline employees didn't get penalized for calling out sick. Um, that would be a huge takeaway for me, for us. Um, and the other thing I will wish for is definitely if this was like a perfect world, um, higher income. Mm -hmm. I think that people don't realize how little flight attendants make. And the story is always told about how flight attendants only make money when they're in the air. And um, that's absolutely true. Mm. Um, our base pay, we're, we're paid hourly and our base pay is a lot like servers. You know, we get served. I used to be in the service industry also for 10 years. 
Um, I love serving and I, I'm super grateful for the restaurant industry, even as a flight attendant, because <laughs> we wouldn't survive without them. I had a layover and there was no food available in Cleveland because everything was shut down or restaurants, everything. But anyway, um, so I'm super grateful. Um, but yeah, I would pay suck, especially when you first start out as a flight attendant. I remember there was a, a time where I was slightly jealous of the MTA workers um, during this time because I felt like if I'm going to be essential, let me get paid like an essential worker. Um, and I was salary, even starting out, it's trash. We huh, don't get paid enough at all. Um, but I believe that that would be a whole nother blog post. <laughs> so I won't get into that. Um, but I'm so grateful for this conversation and shedding light to the similarities um, of us both being the Department of Transportation and how we're facing a lot of the same risk. Um, so, yeah, not being penalized for sick days and being paid like we're frontline employees, being paid like we're in a central worker. That would be nice. Yeah, no, and thank you for your contribution. And everybody um, who who answered Sean, I do. We want to hear from you as well. But we're doing this, and Nussie and I are continuing to do perspectives because we hope when people listen to this, they'll they'll learn something new about what essential workers sound like. You know, from you guys' standpoint, um, we we wanted to have uh, two, three more guests on here, and they come from three different other industries. So we see how we're going to have to have this conversation um, over some time because there's a lot of people who we've been we've been going to restaurants, we've been flying, you know, we've been taking the bus and the train, and we don't think about this. Life has just been going, go, 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 and now we get a chance to actually like, you know, not not to say anything before, but like you know, people might not have been wanting to hear what the the sanitation worker had to say or what your bus driver had to say or what your flight attendant had what they're going through your server. So thank y'all for being on this and, and mm -hmm. your perspective, because we can't make this up. Nessie and I can't speak for you and say how you're, you're doing it. So thank you. Sean? That's how, that's how I look when I'm doing it. I'm like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, one thing I would like to say for all workers, not just particularly for MTA that's out there, you know, for the people that's listening to this, respect the fact that there's people that have to be out there and you don't. Now, what I mean by that is I know there's people out there that lost their jobs and lost their means of income. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about those people that have the opportunity to be off the streets, you up the train to stay home. It's not an easy thing to do. However, when you got sanitation workers, MCA workers, restaurant workers like Eric, airline, airline um, attendants like Ashley, those are in the, those are those are services where you actually got to come into contact with people to talk to them. Like if somebody, Eric can tell you if they if you if he misinterprets an order. If somebody does it in his face without a mask, you know, that could put him in danger. Because you, like I said, you can't get tested unless you're showing symptoms. Right. So, you know, Ashley as well. And, and Pete and myself as our MTA workers, we go through this every day. What happened? What's going on? What, uh, is it okay? People all in your face. Sometimes more than one. So right. for those people that listen to this, please take into consideration that what we're doing out here in, as essential workers is not easy. What you're doing at home is not easy, staying home, staying off the streets. It has to be a common common communication somewhere here because New York City, we can't keep affording having these numbers keep rising up. And people want to get back to some kind of normal living existence, we've got to keep the people that's not essential at home. So, some, something got to reach. And I know there's people that, feel, that, that um, do, don't think that they should stay home. They got a right to be out on the street. But maybe one of their family members is an MTA worker, a flight attendant, a restaurant attendant. You got to take that into consideration. That's what I'm saying. Yeah.
uh, I think it's a bit easier for people to stay home um, now. I guess non-essential workers that did get laid off, not just people who get to work from home um, because of the new uh, unemployment and the stimulus things and things like that. The people who got laid off and can receive unemployment are receiving a lot of money right now. Most of the people who got laid off were the lower end workers like uh, retail and things like that who were making the minimum wage. And with the stimulus and the new unemployment laws, they're making almost a thousand dollars a week for unemployment. So that's even more money than they were making by going to work. And hopefully they're like, hey, I'm making more money now than I was on working. Let me stay home and you know handle this. Now, a few months from now, it's gonna suck because the job market is gonna get flooded for those people because everybody's gonna try to get a job at the same time. But I think with this money that's coming in, hopefully people make, and they have nowhere to spend it, they'll be okay with staying home and not trying to hustle something out in the streets because they're getting that income coming into the house. Yeah. Um, really quick, like, I just want to, I uh, oh, to That's more. definitely a conversation. We get to add more conversations as oh. time goes on because there'll be different kinds of conversations about what's going to come up. Ashley? Yeah, I was going to say, I just want to share um, something as a, you know, essential worker. Um, but during this um, pandemic of COVID-19, my roommate, um, on her flight, a passenger had a massive heart attack. Um, and I remember I was talking to my roommate and my friend, and we, we were talking about what happened. And one of the things that she mentioned is like a part of you know our training is knowing how to do CPR. Um, and she said, that was like one of the scariest moments for her, right? Because CPR requires mouth to mouth, right? And we knew this virus is going around, right? And as a flight attendant, people don't necessarily think about the fact that, again, we are the first responders. Um, and so that's the things that I want people to know about flight, attendant as, flight attendants as well. You don't always have doctors and nurses on your planes, you know. Yes, we have access to call them on the ground, but that still takes time. So, yes, please be respectful of your flight attendants always. Right. Great. Thank you for that. And Prof, did you have anything to add? Um, I will say one thing. As she said, the um, with the mouth-to-mouth, and bringing people back for those that may not know or didn't hear right now new york city or new york state is under a do not resuscitate order so if you happen to flatline you're not getting mouth to mouth you're not getting any of that stuff on the way to the hospital so for those people that don't think that this is serious enough for them to say we're not going to attempt to bring you back to life if you flatline it's a real thing. Yeah. It is definitely real out here. <laughs> it's very real out here. And, um, you know, more and more, there's a lot of, you know, if you have a heart attack, they're not even going to take you to the hospital anymore. They're passing rules, different ethical questions every single day. And, you know, we're all obviously impacted by this, right? Um, and, we really do thank you guys for joining us tonight, Jarrell. Yeah, thank you. And just thank yeah. you for your service. We say thank you for, you know, it's like we reserve that for, for military folks or when we're in a crisis, the, the people who are in the hospitals. But, you know, maybe we get to start looking at each other like, wow, damn, just you're a regular person. Thank you for your regular service. <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate all your perspectives and, uh, you know, Eric saying like, hey, me handling your food is like that's a big deal <laughs> like, if i'm if i'm driving you to work on this bus that's a big deal so hopefully we get to start looking at these professions and um and, and looking at us all as essential so thank you for your thank you for your input thank y'all for logging in with us um you already <laughs> uh that wraps up on perspective episode 12 uh 2.0 quarantine level we getting familiar with it still we're going to be cooking in here every week uh we got a lot going on we'll be here next week 
same back time. But next up is Speaking into Existence with May I Speak. Shout out to WMS Radio. Uh, all the love. Ironperspective.com. I am Perspective 11 at Gmail. Yeah, I don't know why the Gmail came out. What's the handle? <laughs> I am Perspective. At I am Perspective. At I am Perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. You got it, Nussie. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you guys again for joining us here tonight. Um, we really do appreciate you guys jumping in with us last minute. Um, this video will be going out for next Tuesday. So we'll definitely share that link with you guys. Um, if you guys can just send over a headshot for the flyer, um, that would be great. So we can get that out later this week. Okay. Okay. All right. As long as they don't judge me for um, quarantine, we all good because my headshot in this video, we won't look. <laughs> yeah, we're all gonna look very differently in a couple right now. All this facial hair and stuff. Nah, you know, can't try to from can't try to from Facebook. <laughs> Copy it. Now Your that's new, PQ pictures. The new wave is the quarantine pics. We need to see the scruffy, <laughs> the bushy <laughs> ass eyebrows, like. No, we gonna start doing this in our PJs, crust in the eye, and everything. <laughs>